Welcome everyone to Nerd of the Rings. We are here again from Comic-Con today. We are talking with our good friend Jerry Vanderstelt and we're going to talk about this brand new piece. This is in collaboration with Weta Workshop. They just revealed a new statue called Salvation at Mount Doom, um, which we'll get some shots for you. It is just mere feet away from me but right now we're going to talk to jerry about his matching painting here first of all jerry thank you so much for joining me and welcome again to the channel you bet matt always a pleasure to be with you and uh everybody out there welcome uh if you d couldn't make comic-con 2023 well this is the next best thing hopefully and uh yeah here we are yeah, and we're we're in the hustle and bustle. They're getting ready to uh, let exhibitors in here. So, pardon the uh, forklifts and everything. This is now you you get the get the sense of the sounds that happen before you're allowed into the con. But Jerry, let's talk about this incredible painting. Um, how long did this take you to make? I would say um, that's probably a, close to eleven weeks. Um, I can't remember what my answer was on our interview with Smog, but it's probably very close to the same amount of time in this one. And that's, you know, your typical six days a week, 12 plus hours a day, um, loving it and hating it at the same time. No, really loving, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, many, many hours. Yeah. Now, the Weta folks said they've been working on the statue version of this for about two years. Yeah. So at what point in the process did you get involved? When did you know that you were going to be making this? That was, um, that was exactly one year ago uh, at Comic-Con of all places. I was in the back of my booth talking to some of the wonderful Weta folks and they uh, approached me about it. And uh, it wasn't a year of paint time for me, but I had a year to sort of uh, dovetail my schedule in and find out what, what processes they were using and what stage they were at at the time. Uh, so that I could try to get a start and um, so yeah it's it's been a year on and off and um, you kind of need it because there's a lot of times where Weta is going through their own approval processes or there's a, a, a reason they have to pause for a bit so then I have to keep a little bit of a fluid schedule and so it made it a, a project that, that was you know always around the corner so yeah it was a full yeah. year now you uh when when you were on the channel before we were talking about the smaug uh on erebor with the dwarven statues and everything and you mentioned you know how long you spent uh painting scales for smaug yes. so what what was the part of this piece that was kind of the beast that you just had to plug away on well there was two beasts lurking in this painting and uh, one was obviously the feathers because the the hyper detail of what i saw in some of the Obviously, just like the Smog Project, I had a little bit of an inside, so I could see how what they were going. And I realized that the, the attention to detail on uh, <clears throat> Gwai here was so exquisitely hyper that I had to try to follow that. Um, so I would say Gwai here was obviously the center of attention, or at least one of them, one of two at least. So he was probably the most tedious, but the lava was the second monster. And that was just because of fighting the, I don't do lava all the time. And you'd think right after getting off a of smog with fire, I would be, you know, a little bit more used to it, but it's a whole nother animal. So these two were probably the, the, the ones that took the longest and it was a battle, but it's like the two features you really want to do well. So you just have to, you know, almost like I was going through mortar with that <laughs> drudgery and, but no, it's just the nature of painting things like this, but yeah. These two were, were the worst. And then, in, in some funny way, with a lot of the paintings, and Smog's is another example of that, is that a lot of times you'll add just detail as far as you can take it, knowing you're going to have to push it back. But the human eye, just like with Smog and that far wing, for example, it's still, your eye will catch it if you uh, first put it in, lock it away with that same clear coat we talked about before, and then dust it and push it back. And in this case, I had to do that to, to give a sense of depth between the hobbits and uh, Gwaihir there. So, yeah, you, I was going to bring that up, the, uh, the depth here, because this is, like you said uh, earlier, you kind of like to play with the, the timing, you know, so it's yeah. not just a replication of what Weta has done. And you'll yeah. see in the Weta statue, um, there's the, the talons on Gwai here are, are just about to, the left one about to land and the right one about to grab one of the hobbits. 
and uh, and yours is kind of moments before that as mm-hmm. Guai here is kind of mm-hmm. slowing down and um, and you were talking about how you you know you use that uh, that kind of loss of visibility that you get over yeah. uh, over distance absolutely um, you know we we know that in uh, well in observing how the world can be sometimes is depending on the quality of the air there's all these little particles that bounce off of the light and the more particles then you have a little bit of a haze well obviously here there's smoke and ash and so it's even more so so um, hazing it was you know sort of a, a good way to push it back into the distance and try to get that sense of scale um, but then uh, on the flip side I had to make sure that I brought the two hobbits out in the, in the tightest way I could to to sort of um, contrast that idea yeah. and then of course we do have tiny little Ian McKellen there on top of Guai here that's I'm, I'm guessing that's another one where you would uh, you'd have to get out your magnifying glasses for that. those you know you keep telling me I need to post with those on I should I really need to do that now but I did have to use them and once again just like in the smog interview uh, the smallest brush was still too big so what do I do I, I just have to swim through it <laughs> it's, it's a long process but again Knowing that Ian or his agent, you know, they, they approve these, yeah. so you, you're mindful of that, and we wouldn't want to do a disservice to Gandalf, so. Yeah, it's funny. I always kind of envision you with those glasses on, like the uh, guy who fixes up Woody in Toy Story 2, where he's just got layer after layer of these magnifying on as you're doing little tiny Ian McKellen there. Um, so what other, uh, you know, kind of minute details uh, will people notice as they look closer at this piece? Well, depending on what you're looking for, obviously you can see the sting is now on Sam, on Sam, Sam's belt there. Um, if you look really close, you can see a lot of the the uh, scars and wounds that they've acquired over their dangerous journey, and trying to capture the fact that they've they're a little bit dirty and uh, completely just wiped out. And uh, as far as th- them goes uh, that's that's kind of there's there's really some hyper detail in some of the weave of their clothes that I tried to catch um, all the way down to the hairs on their feet for example but uh, there again one of the little details that probably took the most time that you know hopefully people will notice is like funny little details like the way lava as with the viscosity of lava the way as it's cooling you get these funny little folding wrinkles uh, there was lots of studies on documentaries like Hawaiian uh, volcanoes, active volcanoes, how they behaved. And it's surprising how much you sort of just assumed and you were wrong about. So I had to go back and, and kind of really study that so it looked more like there was a flow going on. So hopefully people will spot these tiny little little details and the tiny little cracks. And it's just an odd journey you go down with, with certain things like that. Like you realize when you're paying attention to things like heat, um, if something's flowing past, it's, it's going to stay um, more in the red colors, but if it's cooling down, it starts to turn to black. Yeah. And uh, hopefully it'll train the way you look at it to say this is flowing past. So you are always yeah. paying attention to all these crazy things. Absolutely. Now, uh, you guys, we, we caught it uh, and posted it here on the channel, but you guys revealed both the statue and the painting. Yep. Um, how fun was it to have Richard and Daniel and everybody from Weta here to reveal these uh, side by side? Oh, uh, that was a treat. Uh, you know, I've, I've been to a few reveals in the past, but the fact that they didn't actually have a booth this year, I was able to host that. So it was, it was a thrill for me uh, to watch. And, uh, you know, um, a special thanks to Richard and all the Weta team to allow me to participate again in such a... A beautiful piece that they come out with and also to me it's it's one of those kind of a tearjerker it's a really heartfelt moment uh, with the musical track and uh, the fact that they were sort of juxt- juxtaposed between ending a, a dark quest mm-hmm. and the opening of the sky where you have you have despair and hope coming to one place and uh, it's one of the most beautiful moments of the entire trilogy. Yeah. So I, an honor for me to be a part of that. Yeah, I was just actually thinking about the, uh, you know, how the light in the film comes through and you see the eagles, they start as a silhouette. Yes. And, yes. Uh, you know, you have this, 
this uh, light on the on the right side, darkness on the left of the frame, and I think that's beautifully captured uh, in the piece here. You know, one of the things I was um, doing uh, repetitiously was that one track. I would try to go on YouTube and find the extended version that Howard Shore had done and try to get my mind into that because, you know, trying to actually hear the the falling rocks that are just burning as they're sort of threatening to land at any time. They could wipe them out at any second. And uh, a few evidences of ones that had just maybe missed them. And honestly, <laughs> this, this moment actually brings uh, tears to my eyes often. Um, it's just such a beautifully written um, part of the works of Tolkien. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure you've covered or somebody has covered the fact that why here he had two brothers yep. and what was that third bird perhaps could it have been for Gollum oh yeah I, I have seen that fan theory pop up online quite a bit that it was for Gollum uh, well and, and to me that that sort of you know ties into the tenderness of the way Gandalf spoke of Gollum to Frodo that uh, you know that we don't see all ends and he may have a, a purpose for good or ill so it's just it's all kind of tied to that that tenderness in there so, Jerry, when we were talking a little bit right after the reveal, um, you made an interesting comment about how you had to be really conscious of Gwaihir's posturing because if you did it wrong, it would look like Gwaihir was trying to eat them instead of save them. Absolutely. I mean, if you go back to The Hobbit, uh, it, it's mentioned how the, uh, the eagles would go after the farmer's sheep. Tolkien had written that they weren't kindly birds. Well, they're... They're glorious animals, they're noble animals, uh, but they're not to be messed with. But what, what sort of uh, was, was in my mind at that moment was when I was looking at what Weta had been, what the stage they were at, I, uh, I believe, if I, memory serves, I had inquired if that beak was going to uh, remain partially open. And, but what I, what I kept thinking about was going back to that musical track again, you hear the screech of Gwai here as he's coming through the clouds and getting more solid. I thought it would look really cool to have him like doing that screech right there. But the optics of that might mislead somebody who's not as familiar with the film, just on its face, that he might be zooming in to have a meal. <laughs> so I had to... Just the opposite of what we're going for. Yeah, absolutely. We want rescue, not, a, not dinner time. But uh, I just basically thought, in this way, I'm going to keep... I'm not going to vary. As we talked about with Smog, we like to change it up so that each offers something different. But in this case, I decided it would be much better to stay consistent so that it's a look of concern. Mm. And uh, his, his vision is, is zeroed in on making sure he's going to, just like we see the eagles in uh, the documentaries yeah. that, that can pick up a fish right out of the water. Well, and that's another aspect of the film I wasn't able to quite capture because we're not at that moment, yeah. was the gentleness yes. in which they were sort of floating there hovering and gently scooping them up yes. in a loving way. Right. So that's, that's yeah. Well, it, you did a great job because it it is appropriately named Salvation at Mount Doom after all the statue here, uh, not Supper at Mount Doom. So you did a good job making sure that it didn't come across as Supper at Mount Doom. That would have been a, a very uh, odd twist for sure. Oh, <laughs> the story. No, no doubt about it. It, 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 it's sort of a, a, I guess for me, humorous way. Maybe it's dark humor on my part. <laughs> the uh, piece, Salvation at Mount Doom, I added a subtitle that says, Here at the End of All Things. Oh, I like that. And that's tied to obviously what Frodo said, but... Um, as far as if that beak was open, that might have meant it's mealtime, it's at the end of all things. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, but no, this, uh, and it's amazing how the title can really um, help sell what you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, get people to see and feel. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I kept it pretty much what the same title, but added that little line what Frodo said as far as yeah. the art print goes. Yeah. But, so you, you've known about this Weta statue for one year. a year now. Yeah. So you, uh, you've really had to keep your mouth shut about this whole project, and yes. that's a, uh, all, you know, all in a day's work for you, obviously. You keep <laughs> things under wraps, and then uh, being able to finally reveal it, I'm sure, is, is very exciting. And to be able to do it here at Comic-Con with the Weta folks. Oh, so exciting. And uh, again, it was such an honor for me, Matt, to, uh, to participate in this way. And uh, so it's great people at, at Weta Workshop, and uh, they make you want to work hard. 
because they themselves are, are such uh, hard workers and talented people. They're, they're passionate about what they do and I try to carry that same um, level of, of work ethic and passion and love for the story. This is Tolkien after all and uh, you know it's, it's such an honor to be a part of it in this way. So yeah, I love it. That's, and it, it shines through both in your work and with what is the passion and the love for Middle Earth. And uh, we, are, we are privileged to uh, be able to bask in, uh, in such glorious art pieces. Um, they are phenomenal. You did a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, Thank you, Matt. Appreciate and if, if you guys are at Comic-Con and you're seeing this uh, early enough, you can swing by Jerry's booth. He does have prints of this for sale right now um, and as well as a uh, Comic-Con exclusive uh, trilogy pack. Um, it's only 40 bucks for a print of, uh, there's three prints, one for each film. It is the steel of Comic-Con to be quite honest. <laughs> um, but I, I imagine prints will also be uh, on your website of this. Uh, are yeah. they up now? Uh, they're not on the site at the moment. The site has got a few little tweaks before we can launch it. But um, what we did is, in, t in anticipation of the reveal, we, this piece had already been approved with the studio. So um, the paper Jaclé versions, which are 1624 and 2436, so you have a couple of uh, very large size options, uh, are available here in the booth right now. And they will be available in Canvas editions as well in the store as soon as we uh, launch that store. Very cool. Well, guys, keep your eyes out. If you're here at the convention, go ahead and pick up some of Jerry's amazing work. And uh, if you're not at the convention, we hope you enjoyed this sneak peek and, uh, you know, not sneak peek, but rather this uh, this glimpse into the, the con here. And uh, be sure to check out Jerry's website. And uh, we'll be posting on social media when this print is available online. Um, but Jerry, thanks so much again for joining me. Um, it's been a pleasure as always. You bet, Matt. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. All right, guys. We will see you next time here on Nerd of the Rings.